I think what inspires me about coffee is that it, it's it's many variables. It's the fact that tastes and characteristics and flavor profiles can change much like wine can based on the, the places it comes from it can be exciting because you know you can roast a colombian coffee and get you know dark fruits and chocolates and uh, interesting nutty flavors and then you can go to ethiopia and it changes to more citrus or something like that it's um it's fascinating that from one bean uh, and the way it's roasted and and how you um process it you can obtain different flavors it, it keeps you on your toes it's very interesting it's also really good to to create awesome beverages from it you know that people really enjoy so it's also a really great environment it, uh, hospitality is very important to me it's one of those you know it's hospitality it's, it's fantastic it's something I'm really proud of I was always interested in it because I was in the Navy for some time and coffee was a staple diet in the morning for every sailor who's getting up at 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning. So coffee was always, to me, it was that caffeination that you needed to do your job. Um, so coffee was always a need, um, something that we all need, most of us anyway. Um, it's the second most sold commodity on the planet after petrol. So it's a very important uh, thing for the world, actually. I was working in another job, which was sales, and I got uh, made redundant from that job and I had some money left over uh, from that redundancy. And I decided, well, I like coffee, I should learn more about it because I've, I'm not working, so maybe I should go and do a class. Like a lot of people do, they want to do a barista course or something like that. So I went and did one with uh, Five Senses Coffee, which is a terrific uh, organization all over Australia. And I was fascinated from the get-go learning how to make coffee correctly. I didn't know there was such a way. Most people put instant in a cup, add hot water, a bit of milk and off they go. It's still predominantly what a lot of people do. Coffee's one of those things, either you're gonna get hooked by it, like, a, you know, pulled into it, or you're just gonna say, well, that's fine. But I got addicted or hooked to it. And uh, so in going to those classes, I learned how to make coffee. And I just wanted to to learn more from the from that moment on. And I ended up being a barista after those, you know, the beginning, the intermediate and the advanced classes and a bit of latte art. And I just fell in love with it and I managed to get a job over in Netherlands uh, as the head barista there. And I just did everything they showed me, everything that I'd learned and kept my head down and uh, created some really good beverages and, and uh, my career in coffee has sort of grown from from those training days you know from being a barista to head baristas to cafe manager to wanting to know more and more about coffee um, yeah, it's all right to, for what we do what we put in a cup but how does it get there what are the stages leading up to that cup the bean to the cup what, what are those stages, you know, from the green bean to a roasted bean to a flat white. I wanted to get to know all those stages and I'm still learning. So it's constantly a learning phase. It never stops. Coffee really just needs consistency from bean to cup including the roasting process. The flames have got to be the same. The heat's have roughly got to be the same. The beans operate in a very consistent way. When you think about that, it's like, well, what could you use? If you can't afford $100,000, how are you going to roast these beans? You know, you know what to do. You figured out how it works. How are you going to create a roaster? Basically, I built my first roaster from things that I found on the side of the road. So it initially started with a patio heater and a camping stove ring and a handle. It came alive, this, this mad scientist roaster that I was building. Um, Frankenstein, I think I called it. But um, it came together. But in the end, there was it, I couldn't finish it because I was throwing so many bits together including a, a red handle from a catering thing that you would open up a can of beans with. But I needed a, 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 a bolt to bolt the shaft to the drum. And it was an imperial thread. I couldn't find it anywhere. 
I just was driving my wife nuts. I can't finish it. I need a bolt. I don't know where to get it from. Um, but the house we bought was built in 1917, and the previous owner, Vincenzo, was uh, worked on the railways. And when he went off and sold his house, a lot of his stuff was left over. In, in coffee tins and jars and things. And um, I felt like I was guided to a tin. And I reached into the tin and I poured a few things out. And I found a bolt. And I said, that might work. And I went to the drum and the shaft and I... And it just went in. And I thought, that's... That's the bolt. That's that's it. I've got the bolt. At the time, it didn't mean much to me. It was a bolt. It worked. Um, but it was it fixed it, and so that was brilliant. A really good moment. And then I was able to roast coffee, and I started roasting coffee, and it was fantastic. This thing worked. But I always wanted to build a better one. But when it came down to sitting down with my wife and trying to find a name for um, what it, what I was making here. She said, bolts available. And then it just went flooding back to finding that bolt. And then it was a fix. So coffee's a fix. The bolt, the fix. I always wanted a, a name with four letters. So it was just buff, bolt, you know, uh, whatever you want, just one word. But bolt just matched perfectly. And it's spread now into why that everything is reuse you know, reinvent, repurpose, recycle, just reuse things. And it's, it's come from there. So the whole bolt, the way you look around, like some of the stuff you've been filming or whatever, it all seems to be really, you know, everything's been repaired. Even the toys are fixed, you know. So I just think as, a, as consumers, we consume too much. So that bolt built that Frankenstein roaster, but it can also fix other things as well. Um, so everything you, is here is nothing has been purchased new. Everything's been rebuilt or reused. So, yeah, maybe it's a little bit of that as well. Okay, so that's ready to go in, yeah? Well, the big thing is that it's roasted on a barbecue. Beans need heat. That's my heat source. Beans need to be contained in a drum inside a steel housing and roasted and turned and I found that the barbecue was a great way to go. It's got a great flame, lovely blue flame. I needed a motor for the, to turn at 60 RPM, which it does. And the rest is up here in your head and your nose and your olfactory senses about, about how you roast because the beans do talk to you. They, they crack, they have an aroma when they're ready. They make noises, they talk to you. extremely artisan way because I've got um, no way of knowing if they're ready ex except my eyes and my ears and my nose. So that's what makes me different because I don't believe there's anybody roasting on a barbecue commercially in Australia. Um, and it works. There's a really nice flavor about it because the, the, the beans are roasted over open flame in a drum that has holes in it and those flames really get into that bean and caramelize it and get a wonderful flavor in the milk as well. A lovely depth of flavor in the milk. I often find with bulk coffee that the espresso shines through the milk. And there's nothing worse than having a coffee and you go, oh, that's, that's really nice coffee, but it just disappears in the milk. What bulk does is shine through the milk and pretty much all of my blends do that. Uh, and I do believe that's from the roasting method that I use. Also, um, in the process I mentioned earlier about chaff, which is very, very much like a bowl of peanuts, and what's left at the bottom after you've eaten the peanuts is that chaffy stuff. Coffee beans are the, the same, and uh, after they're roasting, and that chaff comes off the bean, it kind of pops off. Uh, but in other roasters around the world, uh, that chaff roasts with the beans because it's got nowhere to go. But because I've got holes in my drum, the chaff falls out and gets burnt off. So you're getting nothing but coffee bean flavor. There can be a lot of experimentation in coming up with the blends that you want to present to the public. Essentially though, you don't really want to get 
too carried away with it. Some origins have certain identities or characteristics or flavor profiles. And sometimes it's as simple as saying, well, if El Salvador is orange flavored and it has a tinge of citrus or orange, would chocolate go well with orange? Yeah, that would work well. So maybe you should put Colombia and El Salvador together and get this Jaffa-like flavor. And so, but some people may not like uh, chocolate and orange. You know, maybe they want chocolate and raspberry. Most of them generally seem to be quite chocolatey flavored. Because when you roast a bean to medium, medium dark, you're generally going to get some chocolatiness coming out of there. Um, the rest of it, though, is trying to goes well with the chocolate. Some things don't go well, you know. Uh, maybe there's a particular type of bean that tastes quite savory or steak. And do we want that with chocolate? Maybe not. So. You're always learning and, and cupping and tasting your coffee, uh, generally in a, in a, as a long black, as a black coffee to taste it through there. But most of my tasting is done through espresso. If I have an espresso and it's beautifully extracted, generally you can get your flavors and characteristics through the, through the espresso. But it's in my head. I think that's how it works. It just uh, comes out in a blend like that. Some Three Amigos is is Colombia, Peru, and Brazil. So that's South and Central Americans, and they all seem to get along well. So they're three amigos. They're friends, they work well together. And generally you can work with a lot of, of amigos, from Guatemala to El Salvador to Colombia. There's a lot of ways you can go about it. But it can be quite complicated, and some roasters overcomplicated, in my opinion. I try to keep it quite simple. It started off as a roastery. That roaster that I built had a couple of variations uh, and eventually it, it, it turned into a quite decent looking roaster. And uh, I needed, I had a few little customers here and there and I was, but I really needed to get out of the house. <laughs> so I managed to find this place and uh, secure a, a little lease on it, a cheap little lease just so that I could roast my coffee here. And uh, they've been very grateful in letting me have this space. But when I was here, I thought, maybe if I put a coffee machine in here, people might come. I've got beans, I know how to roast them, and I'm a barista. Maybe if I just got a little coffee machine and a fridge and a microwave and just a few little things, it would turn it into a little coffee. And if anybody showed up, hey, why not? That would be great. And uh, people started coming. I put the machine in there and I hand painted some signs and I put them on the street. People saw, you know, barista made coffee in here. And people started driving in and finding me and I, I ended up making some, you know, I, I made some cracking coffees and people kept coming back and it's grown over five years now. I remember making $9 in a day and it does more than that now. <laughs> but I remember making $9, but it was still better than being unemployed. It was something I felt would work, and it did. But the community here is what makes it special. There's been a lot of help from the locals that have been coming in. There's been help with painting. There's been help with electricity and different things. And the staff that I've had over the years has been fantastic. But what's come out of it is a beautiful place to be, a really good place to disconnect and then reconnect. It's, it's this place that you can just shut down for a bit and it's not pretentious in any way. It is what it is. It's a place to relax, and that's what I want it to be. But not just that, it's a community. And before I even started all this, I remember reading something and it said, if, if your cafe can become a community, you've got it made, and it has done. There's a real community of people here that know everyone. Everybody seems to know each other's names, and uh, the kids have a great time. So it's a really special place to come with simple food and great coffee. Yeah, I would say it's developed a little bit of coffee culture, I think more so because he's different. Bolt's different. It's not your average high street cafe, it's completely different. And I think there has been a culture that's formed because of that, because it's not a high end, high street hipster cafe. It, we might be trendy, but we're not hipster in any way. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but um, the, the people that we get here are, uh, are seemingly just into the finer, the, the good things, the finer things in life, but it doesn't have to be high end. Um, 
everything is simple but well done. And so I think the culture here has been one of love and respect. Uh, look after your fellow man as well, a lot of support uh, from my regulars, which has been truly amazing over the years. I've seen uh, mums coming in with babies in their bellies and now they're running around and they're five years old and they've been here. That to me is incredibly special that a mum's come in here with a, a bump and now I can pick the child up and play with it. And that's how long I've been here, you know. And to me, that's fascinating that they've, not only have I seen that baby in the tummy and now runs around, but that's how long I've had regulars, you know, and they love the place and super proud of that. So it is a, it's a different kind of type of culture here, but it's a good one. And it's not um, pretentious. It's just a really nice culture here. People can relax, finally. In amongst the trees, pretty rare. And not be bothered by blasting Harley Davidsons or they can sit underneath trees and the trees, the trees clean the air. It's a beautiful place to be.